This ticker podcast is coming to you from the Citadel Securities Trading Post on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Hi, everybody. I want you to listen to something. Hear it? You could almost miss it. But that's the sound of billions of dollars worth of stock changing hands, flying through the ether. Here, on this more or less exact same spot where I'm standing today, it used to sound like this. That was then. This is now. Then. And now. Still, even though the sound volume has decreased, the volume of trading has increased exponentially. My point being, technology changes everything. You're listening to the Ticker Podcast from IR Magazine, a roundup of this week's leading stories and industry comment from the world of investor relations. Here at the New York Stock Exchange, they say they're determined to be at the forefront of trading technology. And from where I'm standing, the forefront seems like a fairly pleasant place, really. Not so loud anymore. But just exciting enough to be interesting. It's also a magnet of sorts. For money, ideas, and people. Joining us at the Citadel Securities Post today is Radek Barnard. He's created the world's largest electronic investor meeting platform. So Barnard has seen firsthand just how much new technology can disrupt existing business models. Today, what IROs need to know about virtual reality. But first, 10 years after, the global economic meltdown in 2008 did more than wipe out 5 million jobs, force 9 million homes into foreclosure, and devastate stock markets. It also transformed financial communications. Stanton Public Relations and Marketing CEO Alex Stanton on how the new dynamic can help companies navigate the next inevitable downturn. That's up next. Alex Stanton, welcome to the Ticker Podcast. Great to be here. Thank you. Just how did the financial crisis impact financial communications? In one particular important way, it um, forced the uh, development of lots of third parties who are now commentators um, about news, about developments. They, they are actually market movers uh, and key influencers, I think. And for investor relations professionals, um, getting to know those folks, understand how they think. And this goes beyond analysts and people who would, who would uh, track your stock. or um, uh, They might be looking at industries. They may be looking at industry disruption. Uh, they may be technology influencers. But they influence the way investors think about companies uh, and in a profound way. And I think you need to get to know them, you need to influence them in the way you can, and, and, and think about uh, ways to create dialogue with them. What sorts uh, of people are we talking about exactly here? Sort of like uh, bloggers, short sellers? Uh... Well, they could, could be all the above. I think, Jeff, uh, when I think about it, uh, I, I ponder who influences decision making, right? And it's not just a the, the analysts who may be tracking, you know, a stock. People, investors are looking, you know, a variety of places for insight. So if you're uh, if you're an investor in uh, if you're an in- investor, for example, in an insurance company, uh, you're interested to figure out what's going to disrupt the insurance industry, right? What's going to how are online platforms going to change how uh, auto insurance is sold, uh, how how vacation uh, uh, insurance is sold. Um, you know, will people have cars? Um, and how does that change insurance demand? Uh, and I think you can get that view from a, from a variety of places and piece it together into a more informed understanding of, of, of what might move markets and where 
where companies uh, can be successful or not. Yeah, I think it requires more, maybe more collaboration inside companies than has traditionally, you know, happened in, um, between functions. Um, you know, when when you view IR talking to the analyst community and preparing for the quarterly calls and things like that. You know, the reality is you, you, know, you want to be having conversations with communications, you want to be having conversations with compliance, you want to be talking to the people who are in the marketplace who are seeing those developments occur um, and, and taking those understandings and, and feeding them into your investor relations strategy in a way that's, that's compelling and interesting. Um, and so I think it forces more collaboration, it forces more of a 360 view of, of who's influencing the understanding of the investor uh, and do your best to, to influence that in a, in a positive way. How do, you, how do you keep track of them? How it's hard, know, I think. How do you know who they are? I think it's hard. I think it's an ever-expanding um, um, group of people. Um, I think you, you know, if, if you imagine all these people sort of competing for attention um, and, and working with fewer resources, um, but I think certain voices break through on certain issues, and um, if you watch it over time, you see certain thought leaders emerge. Uh, I, think, I think the challenge is for companies and the executives of companies that the uh, investor relations professionals are wanting to put forward and make them thought leaders um, around these issues, because there are so many voices, there's a cacophony basically of voices. How does a CEO or a CFO break through and have a real point of view that's interesting to investors and do that in a sort of a risk-adjusted way. You know, obviously somebody who's a commentator can say whatever they want. I think that's harder. And, and, and so we do a lot of work with, with our clients around how to develop some thought leadership points of view that can break through to the investment community. Just kind of brainstorming here, but I guess I guess that changes how you do investor days and uh, conference presentations and who is on the invite list and, uh, and that sort of thing. I think it, I think it should. I'm not sure it always does, um, but uh, if if you're thinking broadly about uh, about your market and where your market's going to be in three to five years, I I think those points of view belong in investor days. Um, and I think some people embrace that and say, you know, we, I'd rather be part of the conversation than, uh, than, than pretend it doesn't exist. But other people are scared about it because they fear that it undermines their traditional business models. Um, and uh, our view is that you're better to have, uh, have the conversation, be part of the conversation, uh, than, to, uh, than to shut down. And we've seen that play out in, for a variety of you know, of companies uh, where you would, I think uh, you would see reluctantly they come to the conversation sort of at the end, at which point maybe you're participating but you're not influencing, right? Think about electric vehicles and the large car companies who ultimately will control what kind of electric vehicles we drive, right? Somebody's got to buy a car, it's not an app, right? Um, but many of them were pretty reluctant to get into that conversation because they were afraid it was going to disrupt their traditional model. And they left that ground to others who were who were um, more adventurous. But I presume uh, these influencers are more of an issue when it comes to your retail component. I think that's true, Jeff. But I would all I, I think it's hard to say that you know that um, institutional investors aren't consumers too, right? They're influenced by the behavior of their own behaviors by the, the behavior they influence, by the behavior of their kids, right? So you, you can't just say, I don't think that, well, I'm, they're wearing their in, institutional hat today and they're not influenced by that. Uh, I think you have to sort of work both sides of that. Think of them as consumers uh, or business consumers as well as institutional investors. I mean, look at, look at how the, um, uh, the um, impact investing and ESG uh, movement has developed, right? Uh, it, 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 you could argue that some of that makes sense for institutional investors, although it's not proven, right, that it produces investment return. But people's own behaviors, their own feelings about environmental responsibility and social responsibility influence their institutional behavior, right? And so to ignore that side of the street, I think, is, is, is just not, is not fully doing your job. In that case, it's kind of a self-fulfilling 
prophecy to some degree. But there again, I think you have the challenge of how do you, if you if you have that ethos and you believe that that should be a part of your investing philosophy, how do you develop some messaging that's compelling around that that doesn't just sound like everybody else, right? And that's a little bit of what we have today, I believe, is you have a lot of people saying sort of the same things in slightly different ways, uh, just sort of testing the ground. My guess is that's not breaking through uh, to investors in the way that it should. When you're competing in this democratization of voices, right, where um, media are looking for interesting people with interesting perspectives, they don't just say, they don't say, well, I want to hear from the big companies, right? In some ways, I think big companies are disadvantaged because they're presumed to have a more traditional view, right? And, and to have more of a franchise to protect. You see this in a lot of markets where, you know, you have a disruptor coming in. Uh, they often are commanding the conversation because the larger company just can't get there, uh, or isn't willing to say something interesting, have more to lose maybe. Uh, but in fact, in the end, they will influence the market way more. Um, because they'll either buy that disruptive company or they'll end up uh, uh, allying with somebody else. So I think it's making an earlier decision about how you want to play in some of these disruptive markets, and arguably pretty much every market's being disrupted in some way, as opposed to kind of waiting and feeling and seeing how it develops uh, and then running the risk of being late to the game. So I think the challenge for investor relations professionals is they're trying to create the right uh, path for uh, their management is to, is to present that in the right way and get people to stretch a little bit uh, and to be a little more uh, thoughtful and adventurous in how they talk about these, these emerging markets. In your very interesting paper, you also talk about uh, compliance taking a seat at the communications table. Well, I think that's that's been a lasting effect, uh, Jeff, of the financial crisis. Um, and it, 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 I think you could argue sort of both sides of it. it on the one hand, it's, um, it's obviously reined in some communications practices. On the other side of the, uh, it's, it's when c compliance and IR and communication are at the same table, you actually can fight out the issues in the right way and, and get to an answer that's, that's appropriate. And uh, I think compliance people have also, over time, become more attuned to the communications issues and the investor relations issues that, um, that the fellow professionals face. So as opposed to just no, 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 it's become more of a dialogue around, well, we can't do it that way, but we could do it this way, right? A more open dialogue. And I think that's helped uh, unleash some opportunities for companies that maybe didn't exist in the initial days after the financial crisis where a lot of new compliance people were being hired in they were new to their roles. They were maybe used to be lawyers. They got, you know, all of a sudden became compliance people. Nobody wanted to make a mistake. You know, it, it, it sort of had a bit of a freeze frame effect. But now I think we're, we're long enough uh, into this that, that the dialogue is, is flowing more freely. Um, and I think uh, in most cases they're getting to good answers for their, for their companies. You also talk in uh, uh, about a third change, uh, which you describe as the uh, broken social contract between employers and employees. Well, I think it's actually been quite profound, um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, it's be because in New York and, and financial communications was sort of ground zero for the financial crisis. Um, inside many organizations, there were very sizable layoffs and downsizings, and those could have been, you know, young people who were coming into the workforce for the first time. First time, it could have been people who had been in jobs for a long time. All of a sudden, were let go. Everybody experienced that, you know, one or two degrees separated. And people, I think, looked at it and said, "Well, that's just not fair. Um, why did that happen to this person or that situation?" And I think people realize that um, their employment was um, very much uh, uh, at will and, and that the, the, it broke the loyalty commitment, I think, in a lot of people's minds. I could do, uh, people would say, I could do a great job and I could still lose my job, right? Um, why is that fair? So I need to look out for myself more because clearly I can't control these external events. 
And, and I think what that created is this environment that ex still exists, I think, very strongly today, that, that I'm, I'm a, an employee for hire. Uh, I have lots of options. Uh, I can go work on my own. I can work part-time. I can work virtually. Is my current employer the best place for me long-term? Maybe, maybe not. And I think when you cross that chasm, you're not necessarily on the team all the time. Uh, and so I think what, what many companies have realized, including uh, you know, investor relations professionals, where the shareholdings are employees as well, that uh, is not axiomatic that just because you're an employee, an employee that you believe the company's story, right? It's a whole other constituency that has to be convinced and influenced. Uh, and I think we see examples every day where uh, employees are not on the team, uh, where they don't believe the story, and all of a sudden leaks start coming out of the company about things that aren't working or problems that the company's having or things that are the company says that they're doing that aren't actually happening in the real world. And those can be very damaging to an investor story. Um, and there's no easy solution to it other than to be a good, consistent communicator to kind of own up to where your, your, your problems exist um, and, um, and make people feel like they're part of the, of, the, of the story and part of the success of the company. And, and finally, another change uh, that you discuss in your white paper, and this is my favorite, the, uh, the podcasts. This sort of new appetite for, for storytelling. Who would have thought that we've seen? <laughs> yes. Well, I think that it comes from uh, a desire to sort of humanize the conversation. Um, if you think about what, what information we all like to absorb beyond what we read in the headlines, it tends to be sort of the human story behind the story. You know, people are interested in person, uh, profiles of executives. They're interested in people who are doing interesting things. Um, and that's really storytelling. Uh, now, a lot of people said, well, I don't know, radio's dead. Who's ever going to listen to radio? Nobody wants to listen to audio when you can look at video, right? Not right, <laughs> right? Who would have thought that um, millennials would listen to a podcast for 30 minutes, an explainer podcast for 30 minutes on their, on their commute home? I think it goes back to this, this um, appetite for storytelling done in the right way, obviously. And I think that creates a tremendous uh, opportunity for companies because if you can humanize it and if you can tell it, not necessarily always through the corporate voice, voice or through the executive voice, but you can get different levels of the company creating the conversation, it's a whole new way to engage with an audience, particularly, for example, younger investors who are less inclined, I think, to, to listen to the more traditional uh, things that the tools that I are the talking creates. points and right. the, uh, the wrote you know uh, as much as as much as you know we get told well you got to say it in a minute or less yeah. it's got to be three quick points that people can remember there's truth to that right but the fact that there's now this new emerging opportunity in sort of long form conversation I think it just creates a whole other set of opportunities for people I think we're all still learning right it's it's really hard to know which podcasts get real audience versus not and and um, and the metrics aren't there and the data is not there but it'll, it'll it'll get it'll get to that point but I think developing those storytelling muscles is really what IR people need to do uh, and take advantage of, of, of opportunities that um, that just didn't exist before um, for engagement and I think that does extend to other constituencies that IR needs to care about like employees and others, um, and um, I don't think I think it's a trend that's here to stay. I think the technology will evolve, the data analytics around who's listening and why and when will will evolve. But I think uh, IR professionals and companies have to get good at storytelling uh, because it's what their employees want, it's what their investors want, and ultimately, I think it's it's something that will make it make it make it. It'll have staying power, in my opinion. It's not a fleeting thing. And also, I think we need to be conscious of the difference between video and audio, right? You know, one of the things yeah, it, it, that storytelling gives you, right, is a chance to listen to somebody and make judgments about them based upon their voice, how they answer questions, not just in that one-minute quick, 
quick shot on cable TV, right? You get to have a conversation, basically, or be a fly on the wall in a conversation like the one we're having now. Um, and people can make their judgments about, do I believe that person is, is telling the truth? Are they smart about what they're doing? And you do it without the influence of what do they look like, right? What background are they are in, uh, which you always have with video, right? So they're not mutually exclusive, but I think in some ways the podcasting environment creates the potential to have a more sort of trusting um, uh, dialogue. And that's really powerful if you can deliver it in the right way. Uh, you know, I'm not sure personally that it's the best thing that companies are running around and creating their own podcasting channels, because I think in some ways that's a limiting factor, right? I think it's, it, in some ways it's better uh, if you find ways to participate in conversations that are happening outside your company, uh, that doesn't mean podcasting isn't good for, for companies to offer. But in the end, it's a limitation, right? Why am I going to go and listen to a podcast that XYZ Company offers? What I'd like to do um, is, is have a conversation uh, with, a group, with a community of other people that may or may not be associated to that company. So I think people have have gravitated a little bit to let me do my own podcast because I can control that environment as opposed to let me participate in the conversation that others are having using the podcasting um, um, media channel. Alex Stanton, it's been great speaking with you. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Appreciate it. Perhaps nowhere is the promise of virtual reality technology more fecund than in the field of finance. Being able to visualize and organize complex data into an interactive, immersive, and intuitive experience could be a money-making game-changer. Just one small rudimentary example of what I'm talking about is Fidelity's Stock City. Check it out on YouTube and you'll see what I mean. And I could go on. There's really no shortage of examples of how VR can reshape our existing ways of doing things. So what I really want to know is, is there a place for VR in IR? We convened CEO Rad Barnard met me at the Post to help me out with that. So virtual reality technology is the ability to put on a headset and experience in a very submersive way the surroundings, which are virtual, obviously, uh, around you. And there's a different range of applications that we'll discuss a little bit later on that you can use to enhance someone's experience of a scenario or a scene or, a, or, or presence without them actually being there. You've identified a few ways IROs could leverage VR. Let's start with site visits. Absolutely. So if you imagine you put on your headset you know, or your, 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 uh, your goggles, if you like, VR goggles, yeah, um, and you're walked through the, the plant by the investor relations officer. And so, again, proprioception, as we mentioned, is all about sense, right? So firsthand, you are seeing the plant, you are seeing production, you're seeing it in real time. This is not a computer-generated image. It can be a, ca a, a, a camera that's walking you around. And so you are experiencing this as if you were there, that feeling of sense, and you're visualizing exactly what's going on in front of you. You're able to, for the, for the want of a better expression, kick the tires um, by being present without actually having to leave your office. It's a very powerful uh, experience, not, not something that's done today, but let's take it a little bit further. If you're able to, as an investor relations officer, host a, a walkthrough of your plant with 30 people, and they don't have to actually travel there to experience this, but they can experience it quite realistically through a VR headset. Number one, you're saving everybody cost and time. Number two, it's, a, it's much better for the environment because you're reducing on travel. And number three, for an IRO, to actually to, to, to try to organize this event with 30 or 40 different investors. And it could be more than that, right? It could be thousands. It, it takes a lot of time. And this is a very efficient way of getting people into the plant or the production room or whatever it is to experience firsthand what they're investing in. 
So haptic technology is the sense of touch, right? So you can, like your phone gives you feedback when you when you press the, 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 the screen or the button, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's haptic technology. So you're, you're able to be in the same room as people and, you know, shake their hands and, and that would feel real. So it's a real experience. And because, again, the, the headset is wrapped around your eyes, right? You're not distracted by anything else. So you essentially start playing tricks on your brain. And so the whole experience starts to become all-consuming and real. So, yes, at an investor conference, which is usually presentations, question and answer, and then networking, you're able to participate in all three of those as if you were really there. Again, how far from that are we? Long way away. Still a long way. Yeah. And, and, let's, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I don't want to be flippant about it. So it, it has a lot of promise. Um, but it is being adopted in the entertainment markets first, right? So gaming, um, adult industry, and um, property tours and stuff like that. So it's coming. But think about the scale with which you would have to see virtual reality headset deployment to be able to leverage that as, a, as an investor conference uh, concept or even a you know, the property tour. Everybody needs to have one of these headsets. And they're just not that widely adopted yet. I want to make one final point about that, is that one of the things that ch that's facing the finance industry overall, but also will face investor relations, is millennials are making their way through the workforce, right? And the way they consume information, the way they consume uh, entertainment is changing. And so virtual reality really will be a sweet spot for that generation. Of, of users. Product run throughs. Yes. Final one. Okay. Same reasons. One, Same. A, one, yeah. one again, right? So let's let's say, for example, um, I am investing in a clothing manufacturer or a fashion brand. So if I go to a product demo for that brand, haptic technology, which I mentioned before. It's all about touch, right? So you've already got the sense, you're in the room, but now you're touching the material to feel how it, how it looks, sorry, to, to, to feel how it feels without actually, again, being there. And so that's virtual reality headset, but also gloves, right, that deliver that sense. And so you want to be, you know, for, for product demos, it's an ideal tool to use, but also we're a long way away from that still. Suddenly, the retail investor has the same eye to eye, can see the same twitches and same attitude that the PM is getting mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the senior management team. Mm -hmm. I, I think democratization of access to management is already happening. And it's happening because, of course, technology and regulatory changes, but also because there's this groundswell of high net worth individuals globally who in some cases have larger positions in a stock than an institutional investor might have. And so, you know, at, at some level, they deserve the same level of access to a management as the portfolio manager might do, right? Right. It's hard for a management team to see that vast range of investors, you know, once you hit the high net worth and retail investor base. But you can certainly leverage virtual reality to engage with with all of those individuals on a on a scaled basis if you understand what i mean right and deliver a very good user experience to them today virtual conferences not using vr but literally virtual conferences you know it's where you're using video conferencing technology they do try to achieve some of that scale but it's a very different user experience right you're literally looking at a flat screen uh an audio line it's not very immersive. There's plenty of distractions going on. The technology, depending on who you use, is hit and miss. So VR would essentially help truly raise the, the, that, that experience to a whole new level for retail and high net worth individuals. And they deserve it. Just following up on what we were talking about, I think there's going to be a, a point at which retail investors and particularly their teenagers mm -hmm. are going to have an edge on 
portfolio managers and, and giant companies who really aren't grabbing this technology. I Institutions. Could, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, you know, I, I run a technology business that tries to sell technology to the financial services industry. I can tell you right now that my level of disappointment at how rapidly financial services companies adopt new technology is is underwhelming. We uh, are at risk of being displaced or disrupted by retail and younger investors because they are much faster at adopting new technologies, right? Look at how social media has impacted the investing world. Social media wasn't driven by you and I. Social media was driven by the, the adoption rates, driven by millennials, again, right? Or, or our respective children, if you have them. It's not driven by us. We've reacted to that becoming the new source or marketplace for information, but we certainly weren't the drivers of that. So as we talk about virtual reality and other technologies and the impact that they might have of, of empowering retail investors or a younger generation of investors, it's definitely a threat to leaving behind the PM who you know, rolls back in their caftan robe and smokes a cigar and, and reads the newspaper on a Friday morning. You know, year to date, the market has already changed a lot just because of the regulatory changes that we've discussed before, if it too. Um, and no one expected that to happen as quickly as it has. So fast forward a year from now, you, it could be again another whole leap in terms of how people execute investor relations. You know, and virtual reality has come a long way in the last two years. You've got very large organizations investing in the technology. You've got adoption by younger generations for gaming, etc. So, yeah, it's not going to be a long time before we get to seeing some sort of impact on the investor relations from, uh, from that. Brad Barnard, it's been virtually fascinating. Thanks for coming down and speaking with us this afternoon. It's always my pleasure. Thanks, John. That's it for us today. Join us again at the Citadel Securities Post in about a month. We'll hear how best-in-class auto and truck supplier IROs are handling a perfect storm of market uncertainty. And just exactly what do investors want from your next Investor Day? I'll speak with someone who asked them. My thanks to Citadel Securities for hosting us from their post on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Citadel Securities is a member of FINRA and SIPC. The content of this podcast does not necessarily reflect the views of Citadel Securities. Thanks for listening. I'm Jeff Cassette.